So I'm curious what you refer to the field of probability because it's math is never the most popular top, top topic and this is maybe one of the least popular even among math. So what do you do it? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not sure it's it's true anymore. It was, I mean, there was this problem with probability. Uh, there was some confusion on what it was. So first thing is that people thought it was like applied math, but you know, at a time where maybe applied had some negative connotation. And uh, also there was this kind of, I'm sorry, but very naive uh, thinking that in probability you don't truly prove things. You kind of only get uh, uh, an a result with a certain probability, so it's not sure, right? Uh, these things completely change uh, in, in the last 30 years, say, where in combinatorics, it was mentioned this morning, um, there was like uh, 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 a clear uh, realization that thinking probabilistically can prove the existence of objects and things like that. There was also a big connection with, uh, with physics, because we often speak about, you know, quantum physics, like the physics of infinitely small things, where it can be, it can be the interaction between a few atoms sometimes. It can be uh, the physics of the infinitely big, you know, you look at cosmology, like how, I mean, look at solar system, I mean, nine elements, right, the sun, eight planets. Uh, these are like very few things, but when you talk about statistical physics, the physics of our scale, if we are thinking, you know, how the atmosphere around us is behaving, how water flows through, uh, uh, through a river, it's like billions of billions of billions of molecules or particles or that, that interact together. So their probability becomes a very important uh, area, a very important way of simpli simplifying things. We are going to, if you want, study the typical behavior rather than the specific one. And so that... Uh, that's right. Can you do? All right. That's, that's, uh, that's the beauty about the exterior. Um, so, the, I don't think that nowadays Ma uh, probability is considered as a subfield. I mean, uh, uh, on the contrary, many people are interested in it, and uh, and uh, and it feels like a very hype field of mathematics rather than the opposite. Concerning education, I think probability for now is maybe taught in a way that you know it's counting, like uh, you are counting cards, like how many ways can you? I mean, in poker, blah blah. I mean. I can definitely understand that, except if you want to play poker, you find this very boring and many people don't want to play poker. We said many people hate math, I'm pretty sure that much fewer people love poker than math. So my point is that, uh, that maybe we need to reinvent our way of teaching probability and to try to show how useful it is in our reasoning in our everyday life. And there is a lot of improvement there. Uh, potential improvement. Some, some of your most celebrated work is in uh, physical mathematics and in phase transitions. Yeah. So how, how would you explain phase transition to a general person and what sort of phase transitions are you working on? Yeah, so, so a phase transition, to summarize, it's a brutal change of behavior in a, in a system, in a, for instance in a material. I mean, there is one that many people uh, know and very well. It's when you take water, you, you decrease the temperature. If it reaches zero degrees, then it turns into ice. It's at zero degrees, whatever the place on Earth, whatever the quantity of water, it's always zero degrees. And I mean, what the place, I mean, let's say ignore elevation, like at, no, at zero uh, level. And, and, um, and this, this phenomenon, this drastic change of behavior, it's a very interesting change of behavior. Like, so, so, so it's one example of phase transition. You have a second one, which is when you get water to 100 degrees, then it becomes vapor. But there are tons of different uh, transitions, phase transition in nature. For instance, there is one, which is that if you take a magnet, you know, take the magnet on your, on your fridge, take a, I mean, you cannot really do this with a lighter, but if you heat it at a certain temperature, it's going to stop being a magnet. It loses its magnetization. It happens at a certain temperature, called the Curie temperature, for Pierre Curie, the man who discovered it. 
and um, and there again it's a drastic change of behavior between be, be, between being a magnet and not being a magnet as this change. So we try to study that uh, mathematically. We make mathematical caricatures, if you want, of this phenomena, and we try to, uh, to, to see what are the properties of these transitions. How does the material change from one behavior to another one? With the hope that by understanding this transition mechanism, you can understand new, if you want, uh, state of matter, in particular at the phase transition, exactly, so for water it's not so true that at zero degrees exactly there is something interesting happening, because it's a special kind of phase transition, but if you take the magnets exactly at the Curie temperature, the magnet is behaving in a very interesting fashion, and that's what we try to explore mathematically. Are there any sort of applied sciences interested in your work, or is it still sort of theoretical for them? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. So, uh, in some sense, I mean, it's a, it's a very easy question. It's just uh, the answer usually. The, I mean, people don't like it so much. Uh, I mean, I see the, the 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 science and the research has a as a teamwork, a long chain of people you know, transmitting to their uh, next neighbors uh, uh, the information. So I'm kind of like the mathematicians are among the most theoretical people. And what I do is used by people who do a little bit more applied research. But it's not that they are, you know, the people that are making transistors or things like that. It's not, uh, it's still people that would be considered very theoretical. Then these people are going to transmit the research to the next person that is maybe a little bit more applied and more applied and more applied. So there are a few people between me and the application, which make it very difficult for me to guess what's the, the, the potential applications of my research and in addition it's going to take a long time before I get it. And in addition to that, yet you see I mean, there are several downsides for every single math idea that is applied in real world and usually they are transformative when they, they are applied, it really changes our way of, of seeing things. They are like hundreds hundreds of ideas, math ideas, that never found an application. But for the first, for the, the one idea that would be applied to exist, these 100 other ideas were necessary. You need to shoot in the dark if you want to hit the sweet spot. It's, it's, it's really, there is something uh, about, um, about the, 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 the research in math that must be uh, kind of non-applied, that you should be motivated by something else if you want to find ideas that will be sufficiently transformative to actually really change our uh, vision of technology or, uh, or applied science. Do you ever get stuck on something, on a problem? And if so, how do you get over it? Well, I would say that the relevant question is more, uh, do you sometimes not get stuck on a problem, get unstuck? I mean, most of the time I'm stuck on, uh, on a problem. That's actually uh, something you need almost to enjoy when you do research. But that you, uh, you, you end up learning uh, to enjoy. So really this, this status of being learning about something, which is actually uh, also one of the reasons why Quite often, people are surprised, I don't know if it's totally true, but when they interact with mathematicians, they are surprised because they say, oh, I mean, you are pretty modest in, uh, in your goals, in your uh, claims, you know, but I mean, it's mechanical. I mean, most of our time, we don't understand things. We are just facing a wall. We are trying, but not succeeding. So it's not that sometimes I get stuck. I mean, most of my time I'm stuck, except that stuck is just stuck in the sense I don't solve the thing. But my understanding of the thing is always kind of progressing a little bit, maybe even in the wrong direction. But I'm always feeling in movement. It's just that maybe, you know, I, I'm just... Uh, uh, walking in direction uh, just in front of the wall, not finding the hole in the wall yet, but it's this process that is going to allow me at some point to find the weak spot and to push where I should be pushing to solve the problem. And, and you mentioned that uh, math is a team sport, which I think would contradict the stereotype of, you know, the lone mathematician working by himself. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Like, how is math exactly a, a team sport? So. Uh, 
contrary to what one believes, I think, um, our intuition, our math intuition is not, you know, written in our genes. It's something that improves constantly. And it improves by confronting it to the world, and in particular to others. There is no better way to understand that you are wrong about something than actually discussing it with somebody else. Because his intuition is going to be different from yours, and the two, the collision between these two uh, intuitions, or these three, these four, these five, if you are more than that, is actually making you evolve in your positions and collectively you are going to find the right spot. So it's, it's really something where the others help you rewiring, if you want, your brain in the, wrong, in, in the right direction. There are people that work alone, and so that means maybe that for them it's, it's not so fruitful to do that. But for me, you know, it's, it's definitely the immense majority of what I do is collective work. And it doesn't mean that I don't think on my own about the problem, but I need to confront my intuition to the intuition of other mathematicians constantly. That's how I progress. Okay. You also mentioned your, your love for sports. And I think it's probably not too hard to find mathematicians who, who do art or music or sports. Yeah. But I think it's very rare to find artists or musicians or athletes who do mathematics on the side. Like, why do you think that is? Is there a steep learning curve or what's the... No, I, I think it's because mathematics as a hobby has not been sufficiently explored. I mean, you need the material. It's not that you can go in the park and, and do mathematics if you are not taught what to... I mean, of course, you can do that at the end. But you need to to have, you know, maybe... I don't like to call them problems because people are afraid. I mean, <laughs> it means what it means. But, you know, uh, questions. You need to have math questions or, or enigmas that are roughly at your level and your... Uh, uh, and, and in you, I mean of your kind of interest. So this, I think, there is still a lot of room for vulgarization, for mediation, to create this material that people are going to be able to use to have fun trying to solve small math problems. They are not going to be new, you know, math things that nobody ever discovered, at least in the majority of the case, even if there are few fun exceptions. Uh, in, in particular, in tiling, there were some completely amateur um, uh, mathematician that found some new tilings that mathematician didn't see before. But I mean, uh, globally, I would say that there is a lot of room for this leisure mathematics that we just didn't explore. And as long as we don't provide this material, it's like we didn't create the instrument. So of course, people are not going to play music. You know, I mean, if, if people don't know what a guitar is, how would they play music? I mean, guitar music, let's say. So how, how do we do it? You're a, you're a practitioner, we're communicators. How do we sort of work together to make mathematics as a hobby more attractive? Uh, so first, it's, a, it's almost a full-time job, I must say. It's something that one should not minimize the difficulty of, of doing that. Um, indeed, one has to think, you know, in some sense, what are the the right games that make people enrolled in, a, in some kind of solving uh, mechanism that is similar to what you see in math. You want to try to avoid as much as possible uh, the formalism, at least in the first place. I mean, if people start to, to get enrolled in, I mean, get enthusiastic about solving problems without formalism, then they will be keen to learn a little bit of formalism, to get to the next level of subtlety, in some sense, in problems. So there are a lot of logical problems, uh, I mean, geometric vision problems, I mean, algorithmic problems that I think are maybe not completely impossible to transfer into, uh, into, uh, in, in, into things that can be done by, uh, uh, by people. My, my guess is that most of the time, they are too hard, the existing ones. There are, like many, there are a list of problems. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't remember the name of this, this guy in the States uh, that, that was producing one problem a week. And uh, there is a huge class of problems. But you know, even me, when I look at this problem, it's not like uh, so clear. I mean, 
there are problems for people that are already completely convinced that math is a cool thing and that they want to spend really a lot of time thinking about it. I think there is a problem of level. You, you want to be reaching like a much wider class of people. I mean, many mathematicians look down at Sudoku as, you know, I mean, come on, it's not real math, it's complete. But at the end, Sudoku is the right level for people in terms of logical thinking. It's, it is logical thinking, it's a very smart and subtle logical thinking. There is a natural way of increasing in level, keeping the same formalism in some sense. Once you understand the rule, you can increase in... So, uh, so it's not surprising that this, uh, this is enjoyed by people and that uh, my mother-in-law uh, loves to do Sudoku and uh, uh, she's not especially good at it, but she's enjoying it. And, uh, and I think this is perfect. We need more of those things, more of those, uh, and, and, and make re people realize that it's not very far from what we do in math. That it's the ca same kind of thing. That's the problem is that if you tell them you are doing math, they tell you, no, I'm doing Sudoku, I'm doing a game. It's not, uh, but it's, it's like saying, I mean, they forget that when they are reading their, uh, their last uh, thriller, it doesn't have much to do at first sight with, you know, the orthographic uh, class that they had uh, when they were, or the grammar class that they had when they were a kid. But in fact, it's the same thing. It just, uh, you need one to be good at the others and vice versa. You need the others to enjoy, you know, the, 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 out, the output of the first thing. So it's the same thing for math. Finding things that, uh, games that people will enjoy and that they can relate a little bit to math. Yeah, I think this entry level is particularly hard to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's not surprising that we are having difficulties uh, with that. And, uh, and, um, and also, not to make the thing worse, but a, a little bit. Um, you see, if, if people would be allowed to open a book for the first time when they are 16 or 17, they would hate reading. They actually like reading because along the learning process they had books to read and they enjoyed this part of the thing, right? It's not the school reading that they enjoy, it's actual reading books outside. So in addition, for making people think that math can be a hobby, you need to be able to have problems of math that people can enjoy from day one, from age six, seven, eight, nine, etc. So, I mean, before that, we are lucky human is such that he actually has games, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm, this is a very good example of, of uh, um, David Bessis in France. He wrote a beautiful book that I think just got translated in English, so I'm recommending it. It's called Mathematica. David Bessis, and he's saying, you know, there is this thing we don't realize. You know this game with holes of different shape? Yeah. and you put, you know, uh, balls in, into a circle or a cube into a... So you see kids playing at that and you, you wonder, you know, yeah, it's very fun to see your kids playing at that because they are completely, uh, I mean, they are super bad at it, right? They, they try, like, they try the ball on the square thing and if it doesn't work, their answer is to try harder and harder. And, but there is a good, I mean, this game is actually fantastic because if you think about it, the kid is learning the notion of shape when he does that. He doesn't have the notion of shape before. He's learning it here. He understands that, you know, a sphere is different from a square. And he, he, he can, and he becomes very intuitive. Of course, when he's a three and not two, then it's like, boom, boom, boom. It's completely trivial too. But he learned it through a game. So up to age five or six, actually, most of the learning in math, you know, learning how to count, kids naturally think, that this is a game. So, so in some sense, maybe there is nothing really to do before that, but at age six and more, then I think we should manage to find something that gets out of school that is like hobby math. And lastly, for me at least, because you, you touched upon it in the panel, uh, uh, the matter of diversity in mathematics. I was, because you mentioned you also talked to a minister or some politician, about, I was just wondering how do you see in general the, the problem of diversity in it is, yeah, I, I think the question of gender balance is a very big question, but it's a little bit like, uh, and it's, uh, maybe that's the first thing to solve, I, I kind of agree, but it's, it's, uh, it's also hiding a forest of other problems. I mean, I had very few women in my class in ENS. I had zero, you know, uh, person from minorities, zero. Like it's not even one, it was zero. 
It was like only white people. Out of how many? 40 or 50, something like that. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there were like uh, five women, which is definitely not enough, but there were zero uh, people uh, for minorities. So there is an actual, uh, I mean, zero or one. I mean, so there is really a, a question, a more general question of, uh, of how we, we welcome all this diversity in, 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 uh, in, um, in mathematics. And I think the reason, it's a little bit what I was mentioning earlier, mathematics, because it's a very tough learning, saying that math is not difficult is just a lie. Math is difficult. That's true. Like every single other thing. Reading is difficult. Walking is difficult. Everybody reads. Everybody walks. I mean, okay? It's the same for math, it's just that people stop in the process because they think that they are not allowed to, have, uh, to make mistakes, blah, 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 all the standard things that we say about uh, learning. But as a difficult thing, one of the first things that, that comes up is that any good reason, uh, artificially good reason to stop is a good reason to, uh, to stop. So you are, I mean, when you learn something tough, you are much more a uh, victim of stereotypes because the stereotypes are going to give you an exit door and you are going to take it. It's kind of human, uh, natural things to do. So math, from that point of view, because it's difficult, people are very, very sensitive to stereotypes and people that suffer the most are people that are in minorities, the, at least in this, uh, this group. So women and, uh, and then people uh, from minorities. Uh, so as long as we will not fight the difficulty of mathematics, try to understand that this is a process that is taking its time, maybe, you know, having tried to fight the cumulative aspect that uh, if you miss a jump, then you are lost. Maybe, you know, if you miss a jump, you should be in a group of people that miss this jump until you all get that, you, un uh, you understand this, uh, this, uh, this step, sorry, not jump, this step, and then you, you, you get to the next step. So maybe as long as we will have a very monolithic vision of learning math, people would be naturally led to, to surrender and the first people to surrender are the people in minorities. Okay. And that we will have our time to fight.